For the next two weeks in class, uh, instead of learning new material, we're going to be taking time to get a feel for how our stoichiometry works in the laboratory setting. You guys are going to be performing a very simple experiment at home using baking soda that will allow you to put some of your stoichiometry skills to the test. Specifically, this particular video is designed to help those of you who happen to have a kitchen balance or scale available. If you do not have one of those, there is a second video available via the procedure document that allows you to see different ways of performing the experiment so you can still get at the data that you're looking for. Let's start this video with a quick overview of the kind of things we're going to be talking about. We're going to start with a rundown of the introduction and objectives of the experiments. We're then going to dive into the actual chemical reaction itself. Once we understand the reaction, we'll dive right into the actual procedure. Our first order of business will be recording the mass of baking soda that's used. We'll then use that mass to calculate the theoretical yield of our reaction using stoichiometry. We'll then go through the process of running the actual experiment and collecting the data on how much carbon dioxide was produced. We'll talk about how then to calculate that mass of carbon dioxide collected or our actual yield. And then finally, we'll wrap the experiment up by calculating the percent yield of our chemical reaction. Throughout this process, I'm going to go through a demo trial that you can use as a template for performing the trial that you need to do at home. Everything that's covered in this video is also covered typed up on the actual lab experiment sheet. This is designed simply to be a supplement to help those of you that need a more visual explanation of what's going on work your way through the experiment without having the luxury of us in the classroom and me being able to walk you through certain problems. As always though, if you're struggling with the experiment, you can contact me at any time during the week and the following week to get information and help on how to do your experiment. So to start us off, let's go through some of the objectives of the experiment. I think it's very important to know why you're doing an experiment such as this one before you start trying to actually accomplish the experiment itself. First off, uh, our job is to use stoichiometry to predict the outcome of a chemical reaction or theoretical yield. This is the sole purpose of stoichiometry and what it's designed to do. And I think it's important before you walk away from a topic like this to have an opportunity at least once to use it for its intended goal. Once we've finished the stoichiometry, our next job is to perform that actual chemical reaction based on the setup we use in the stoichiometry calculation. And the reason we do the two of these together is because the ultimate goal is to compare the outcome of your real reaction, the actual yield, to the prediction from the stoichiometry, the theoretical yield, by calculating what we now know as a percent yield. And that's a lot of different types of yields. And again, seeing this thing happen in person, I think, is going to create a much more tangible experience for what stoichiometry is and how all the math surrounding it really gets an important job in chemistry done. Now that we know why we are doing our experiment, our next order of business is the actual reaction itself. This reaction again is available through the lab data sheet, uh, but here it is uh, for the video as well. We're going to start our reaction by taking NaHCO3, sodium bicarbonate, that is our baking soda. Depending on the procedure you are following along with, you're either going to weigh out a specific sample of sodium bicarbonate, or you're going to get a certain number of teaspoons of sodium bicarbonate and then determine the mass you have available through some calculations. We're going to be combining that sodium bicarbonate with uh, acetic acid, better known as vinegar. Uh, each time you do the trial, you're going to use approximately one cup of vinegar, and you're going to place that directionally in a reaction vessel. The amount of vinegar you use isn't super duper important, as long as it's about one cup, uh, since the vinegar is not going to be our limiting reactant. Having a little bit extra or a little bit less uh, isn't going to affect the outcome, hypothetically. When the two of those chemicals combine, it's going to produce a reaction I think many of us are very familiar with. A lot of baking soda volcanoes are made in this fashion. Uh, it's going to produce a couple different products. Uh, you're going to get sodium acetate and water, and these are chemicals that are going to remain inside the container at the end of the reaction. That's what's going to be left over. And it's just going to look like regular old water because the sodium, bicar or the sodium acetate dissolves very, very well in the water. The other product we're going to be creating is the one that we are interested in this experiment. The carbon dioxide is going to be formed as a gas, which is what carbon dioxide always is at room temperature. It'll be our job to record the mass of carbon dioxide that is produced in this reaction. We're going to do that one of two ways, again, depending on the procedure you're using. 
If you're using a balance, we're going to record that by taking the difference of the masses of the reactants and products, and we'll talk more about that down the road. If you don't have a balance, we'll be capturing the carbon dioxide using a balloon and then making some measurements of that balloon to determine first the volume of carbon dioxide formed and then ultimately the mass of carbon dioxide formed. Regardless of the procedure you're going to be working with, uh, you're going to be doing exactly the same stoichiometry as everybody else. And that stoichiometry is going to be based off of the amount of sodium bicarbonate we start the reaction with and the amount of carbon dioxide we're expected to produce in the reaction. And we're going to need a mole-to-mole -mole ratio that links the two of those together. Luckily for us, this is a very simple reaction that's easy to balance. It's a one-to-one mole-to-mole ratio. And we'll save that number for a little bit later on in the video. We're now ready to dive right into the experimental procedure itself, but again, I want to warn you, this procedure is designed for those of you who have a balance at home, either a digital balance or even an analog balance to get the job done. Uh, this is by far the easier way to do the experiment. It's also going to produce some better results, but if you don't have a balance, don't feel like you're at a disadvantage. The quality of the results you get has no bearing whatsoever on the grade in your experiment. Uh, your job is simply to come up with some answers. If you have lower quality equipment, you're simply going to talk about that when you have an error discussion later on in the process. So again, if you do not have a digital balance, you should stop this video now and switch over to the other video and watch the procedure that goes along there. If you do have a balance at home, let's get going. To start your experiment, you're going to need a sample of the baking soda, the sodium bicarbonate. The amount of baking soda that you use in your experiment is not very important. The only requirement is, is that the amount of baking soda you use is different than the amount of baking soda that your lab partners use, preferably by a significant amount. Using a digital balance, recording the mass of your baking soda is very simple and exactly the same as how we've done things in class. Turning your balance on and giving it a minute to uh, calibrate itself, you're going to need to put on a secondary container to hold your sample. In this case, I'm using this small orange bowl. I'm going to press the zero button to re-zero the balance so it reels out, reads out 0, 0.0 grams. And I'm going to add my baking soda in. I'm using a regular old spoon and spooning it in there. And we'll see how much we end up getting when I add all this in. <clears throat> I've added in my baking soda. My balance is reading 7.1 grams. We've now got our sample of baking soda ready to go. Now that we've recorded the mass of our sodium bicarbonate we're going to be using in our trial, I think it's important to start talking about the fact that you should be recording all of this data in a data table. I've created this data table here that will certainly get the job done. Your data table certainly doesn't have to look the same as mine. You and your two other partners are going to be recording one trial each. I'll be recording the data that I have done in my experiment in trial number one, and your partners will record them in trial two and trial three to ultimately produce three trials for your experiment. If you recall from our previous step, we were able to get 7.1 grams of the sodium bicarbonate measured and ready to go for our reaction. We'll write that number into our space and move on to next steps. With our recorded mass of sodium bicarbonate, it's now ready to calculate the theoretical yield of carbon dioxide. Knowing how much sodium bicarbonate we're starting with and assuming that the acetic acid is in excess, we can use stoichiometry to predict how many grams of carbon dioxide should be produced. And I think you hopefully should realize that this problem we can treat like any other stoichiometry problem that we've done before, but in this case using the mass we recorded as opposed to a number that's been provided by me. If you want to know what that problem is going to look like, here it is right here. I've got the balanced chemical reaction listed up above, and our job is to calculate the mass of carbon dioxide produced by completely reacting 7.1 grams of sodium bicarbonate with excess acetic acid. And again, my 7.1 grams comes from the measurement of the amount of sodium bicarbonate I used in my particular trial. You might have used more or less. In fact, you should be using more or less because we want as many different versions of this experiment as possible. You're just going to replace your number with the 7.1 7.1 grams that I got. Just like any stoichiometry problem, to do the calculation we are going to need a mole to mole ratio. We identified that earlier as one mole of sodium bicarbonate reacts to make one mole of carbon dioxide. With all our information ready, we can start a stoichiometry problem just like the ones you've been doing all along. We'll start with the 7.1 grams of the sodium bicarbonate that we uh, measured out. 
We're going to go then and convert the 7.1 grams into moles of sodium bicarbonate as our first conversion step. We'll use our mole to mole ratio second to convert how much sodium bicarbonate we have into how much carbon dioxide we should produce. And then last but not least, we'll convert the moles of carbon dioxide produced into grams of carbon dioxide. And I now know, after plugging all this into my calculator, that my theoretical yield should be 3.7 grams of carbon dioxide. And again, what this means is that when I really perform my experiment in just a few moments, I should expect to get just about 3.7 grams of carbon dioxide out as a product. Now you may or may not get that quantity, but this at least gets us a target for something to expect. Before moving further, let's go back to our data table and update it with the new data that we've collected. Uh, we've determined that our theoretical yield from our stoichiometry would be 3.7 grams, and I've added that number in. Now that we were able to predict the amount of carbon dioxide our reaction should produce, our job now is to set up so that we can actually run the reaction to get the actual yield of our reaction. Uh, we're going to be running the reaction in this clear container here. Uh, the container you choose to use is not super duper important. I just found that you get much better results if the container is clear so you can see the contents inside very, very easily. To that clear container, we're going to add in our second reactant, in this case the acetic acid or vinegar. The amount of vinegar you use is not super duper crucial because it is not our limiting reactant, but at the same time we still want to have about one cup of the vinegar to make sure that we do have it in excess. I've measured out my one cup of vinegar. I am going to pour it into my reaction vessel here, and we're ready to move on to next steps. Now that we have our reactants measured out, uh, the first thing we need to record, the first data value we need to get here is the total mass of all the reactants. Later on in the experiment, we're going to take the difference of the mass of the reactants from the mass of the products, and that's what's going to allow us to calculate the mass of the carbon dioxide that was produced in this reaction. To make that measurement, I've got my digital balance turned on and zeroed out. I'm going to take my acetic acid that I just measured and place it on the balance. I'm going to put this paper plate on top, which is going to allow me to then put my baking soda solution on top of that allowing me to record the total mass of all of the reactants I have. When you go to record your mass later on, make sure you have all these parts available again so we can get an accurate mass of the products as related to the reactants. After recording our first data value, the mass of all the reactants and the containers they're in, again we'll take a moment, we'll add that data value into our data table. We were able to collect or measure 439.8 grams of total reactants, the sodium bicarbonate and the vinegar, plus all of their containers. Now that we have our reactants ready to go and our total mass of all the reactants recorded, it's ready to start running the reaction itself. The way we're going to do this is simply by adding the baking soda and the vinegar together, and the reaction should start immediately. Our job, however, is to make sure that the reaction runs completely. And even though most of the reaction will happen in the first minute, the entirety of the reaction is probably going to take somewhere closer to 5 to 10 minutes to get done. What we are looking for to determine when the reaction is completed is the formation of bubbles. As long as new bubbles keep forming and sticking to the sides of your container, that means the reaction is still running and you've got to keep letting it go and keep running the reaction until those bubbles stop forming. I'm going to start my reaction now by adding in my baking soda. Try to get as much of the baking soda in there as possible. And as you can see, my reaction is happening pretty vigorously right now with a whole lot of bubbles and a whole lot of foam being created. But after that initial kind of shock happens, you'll see the reaction slows significantly, and this is certainly what we're going to expect. Our job right now is to have this reaction run its entirety, and all those tiny little bubbles, which is our carbon dioxide, we want to have escape the container. To make sure that this occurs, a little bit of stirring is certainly very helpful. Not only does the stirring help the chemicals mix together a little bit more, but it also helps to dislodge bubbles that are stuck to the bottom of the container. Like I said, our job right now is to get all of that carbon dioxide out there as possible. That's the way we're going to measure how much carbon dioxide is formed. Any bubbles that are left behind are going to uh, impact our measurements. As you can see, as I continue to stir and get rid of the bubbles, new bubbles continue to form, and this is what we're looking for. What you basically want to do is let this go on for a couple of minutes stirring occasionally to dislodge any of those bubbles. 
If you see more bubbles form, keep stirring, keep dislodging, and then eventually, after a certain amount of time, you won't see any more bubbles created. And that's how you know your reaction is done. At this point in time, my reactions had about 10 minutes to run. I'm not seeing the formation of any new bubbles, so that gives me the idea that the reaction is complete. I can't stress enough, though, the importance of taking this time. What I found in my trials with this is giving your reaction enough time to run is one of the biggest factors in determining the actual yield of your reaction and ultimately the quality of the percent yield of your reaction. Once you do believe your reaction is completed, our next order of business is to go back with our digital balance and record the final mass of all the products that were collected. And we're going to record this the same way we recorded the initial mass of all the reactants. I've got my balance turned on. I've got it set to zero. I'm going to replace my reaction container with my solution in it. I'm going to replace the same paper plate I used before. And I'm going to replace the dish I had the original uh, baking soda in. These are all the same containers, and again, according to conservation of matter, the amount of matter before and after should be the same, but as we'll see in just a moment, those numbers actually end up being just a little bit different, and we'll talk about why. Now that we've completed running our reaction, we've allowed all of those bubbles in the formula to form, we've allowed all of them to bubble out into the room, getting rid of as many as possible, we're able to record the mass of the containers and all of the stuff after the reaction is done. Now after the reaction is done, that CO2 bubbled out of the container, so this is all of our products minus the mass of the CO2. And that new weight is 436.2 grams. Now that we've collected all of our data from the experiment, it's time to do a little mathematical magic here to determine the actual yield or the mass of carbon dioxide formed in this reaction. The way we're going to be doing this is a little non-obvious. Uh, it might seem simpler just to collect the carbon dioxide directly. The other half of the class is doing that by using balloons to capture the CO2 and then make measurements of the actual balloons. But I think you'll find that this methodology is actually much more accurate. And you guys will end up getting better results than the half of the class that's doing the more obvious thing of collecting the carbon dioxide. What we're about to do is all based on the concept of the conservation of matter. And what that tells us is that the total mass of the reactants has to be exactly the same as the total mass of the product. Matter is never created or destroyed. Let's take a look at what this looks like using the actual reaction. On the left side, I have my two reactants, the sodium bicarbonate and the acetic acid. On the right side, I have my products, the sodium acetate, the water, and the carbon dioxide. And again, according to conservation of matter, the total mass of the reactants in green on the left should be the same as the total mass of the products in blue on the right. Now, we recorded data values similar to this, but they didn't actually end up being the same. And if you recall, the reason they didn't weren't the same is not because conservation of matter isn't being followed, it's always followed, but because we weren't able to actually collect all of the products. The carbon dioxide, if you recall, bubbles out of the container. It escapes into the room and becomes part of our atmosphere in the room. Meaning the amount of product we collected is only the sodium acetate in the water, not the carbon dioxide. Now let's take a look at some of the numbers that went along with this as well. We started with the total mass of all the reactants in their containers as being 439.8 grams. When the reaction was done, we found the total mass of the products in their containers was only 436.2. Now again, conservation of matter says those numbers should be the same, but they're not because the carbon dioxide escaped. Therefore, the difference between the two numbers must be the mass of the carbon dioxide that escaped. The only thing that's missing from that second value is the carbon dioxide that bubbled out into the room. When we calculate the answer to this, we determine that the mass of the carbon dioxide that escaped must be 3.6 grams, which is now our actual yield of CO2. Just like before, we're going to take a moment, update our data table. We've been able now to determine the actual yield of CO2, the mass of the carbon dioxide, and we determined that was 3.6 grams. Home stretch, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time to calculate the percent yield of your reaction. We have used stoichiometry to determine the theoretical yield. We've actually performed the experiment and done some math to then calculate the actual yield. And if you recall from our previous work in this chapter, our percent yield is the actual yield, what we were able to get, divided by the theoretical yield, what we should have gotten under ideal conditions, and then we multiply it by 100. Let's take our numbers from our data table, plug them in, 
and we get something that looks like this. Our percent yield is the 3.6 grams we actually collected divided by the 3.7 grams we should have collected times 100, which gives us a 97% yield. And that's a great percent yield for any type of chemical reaction. Now, when you are performing your experiment, you might find that your percent yield is lower than mine. What I've noticed during the trials that I've done is the key thing to getting a high percent yield is to make sure you give your reaction enough time and to make sure you get all those bubbles out of the solution. I was able to do this later on after multiple trials with this with a clear container that allowed me to see things much better and I got much, much better results with that clear container than I ever did with a clarity one because I could see those bubbles in there. So if you run your experiment, if you don't like your results and you want to get that percent yield higher, try it again, use a clear container, get all those bubbles out as quickly as, you, as much as you can, let that reaction run for a long period of time, 10, 15, 20 minutes, and you'll find you get much, much better results. But again, no, you're not being graded on the quality of results. If your yield ends up being 80% or 60% or 40%, I'm not going to take off points because you didn't get a high percent yield, but I will expect you to explain why your percent yield is low. Just like always, we'll take a moment and update our data table. Uh, we've now calculated the final data value in our experiment, the percent yield. We'll add that in. And you've now completed the data collection for your specific trial of the experiment. Your partners should be completing their trials as well. And you can plug that information in as trial two and trial three. And then ultimately, we'll use the results for all three of these trials to come up with some uh, conclusions about our experiment, which will be the work we'll be doing next week. So that's pretty much it, ladies and gentlemen. We were able to, in this experiment, using a controlled experiment, do a couple of different things. Uh, we were able to use stoichiometry to predict the mass of carbon dioxide a reaction should form based on a specific amount of sodium bicarbonate, and this is called our theoretical yield. We were then able to run the reaction and collect data that related to how much mass the reactants had and how much mass the products had to allow us to determine the mass, quote unquote, lost when the CO2 escaped into the room. This is what allowed us to measure the actual yield by taking the difference in the masses before and after the reaction. And then ultimately, we were able to calculate the percent yield of our reaction as a ratio of the actual to theoretical yield to determine how efficient our reaction process was. Again, uh, hopefully this went by well for you guys. Hopefully it gave you an opportunity to see this uh, process of stoichiometry in a more realistic setting so you get a better appreciation for what this is all about. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions or concerns, do not hesitate to contact me. See me in class during this week and I'll be glad to walk you through any steps of this process that weren't obvious or simply send me an email and I'll be glad to answer your questions to the best of my ability. But we'll come up with some way of making sure you understand what's going on. I think that's it for me now. Uh, like I said, we'll be talking later on this week and late next week to determine what we're going to be doing with these results in terms of reporting out the work that you've done.